Do I have any audio on it? Yeah, I do. I have a, uh, audio on AirPods. Okay, I think we're good. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, go. Let's see what's happening. Wow. It's like a 20 second delay. <laughs> okay, well, we're just going to roll with it. So, uh, I don't know if anybody is actually live or on this thing right now. I don't uh, know if I have any way of seeing that um, right from where I'm looking because I am using a different piece of software that's not quite connected to YouTube the same way uh, it would be if I was uh, streaming through YouTube. Anyway, I'm babbling, talking out loud. So let me do this. Let me take this opportunity, since it looks like everything is working, sort of, kind of, um, to tell you a little bit about uh, why we're here, what this channel is about, how I got here, my story, as it were. And um, I don't know if it's interesting or not, but uh, it will help to at least provide a little context for why I'm doing some, wow, man, this glare is terrible why I'm doing some of the things uh, that I'm doing with um, 3D printing and with building geodesic domes and living off of the grid and experimenting with up and coming technologies and working with new manufacturing principles and working with new materials and working with uh, new techniques. Uh, all in the name of uh, producing products now uh, in a much different way than they've ever been produced before. We, I think, I feel anyway, that um, there have been some breakthroughs pretty recently in, in technology such as 3D printing um, that are really enabling us as a people to uh, bring our ideas to the world in a much quicker, much more direct way. And with the, uh, the starting of the company that I call uh, Sanctuary Domes, Sanctuary Grow Domes, and also with a uh, side company to that, sister company to that called uh, uh, Aero Grow, I'm hoping to, uh, to really bring that idea to the forefront and to uh, offer some products that use these new technologies and methods, which are available to, uh, they're available to anybody. And that's kind of the magic of this whole thing is that uh, these are available to anybody. So let's, let's, without further ado, let me tell you the story. Okay, so about uh, almost, uh, oddly enough, almost exactly a year ago, uh, when this whole, uh, this whole COVID madness uh, started, it started up in uh, you know, late February, early March, uh, I was working at a, uh, I guess what you would call an advertising agency in, in um, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was in uh, in marketing. I've been in marketing for a long time. Uh, let's see. I guess about uh, maybe two, about twelve or thirteen years. I've been working in marketing. I've been director of marketing for a couple different manufacturers here in the Lehigh Valley, and uh, done all of that. So anyway, at the beginning of COVID, uh, I, I was let go, as they say, uh, from the the agency and. Uh, you know, it just everything happened really quickly, uh, it, as it did for everybody. Uh, it was like one day everything was as usual, and the next day, of course, uh, the world was upside down, you know, and the rug got pulled out, so to speak. So uh, there have been you know, a couple times I've kind of had kind of an interesting life. Um, I'm not going to get into all that, but there have been a couple of times in my life where I had this feeling that uh, I don't know how else to describe it other than to say it feels like a big hand kind of comes down, picks you up, moves you into something else or somewhere else in the world or another situation or what have you, and plops you down. And then you wake up and you look around and you're like, ha, ah, how did I get here? <laughs> but you love where you are. You love this new place. This new place is amazing. You, you, you can't figure out maybe quite how you got there, but you, you know, the hand got you there, right? Uh, we, I'm not going to go into um, what the hand may be. That's a, another channel that I have. Feel free to check that out. I'll put a, a link to it below. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the hand came down, picked me up, put me down into uh, this world now of, of just this camera, this world of COVID and 
no job and insecurities and, uh, you know, all the potential stuff that can come up when, uh, when the world gets turned upside down. Right. So, uh, you know, I immediately, immediately kind of felt that hand saying, or that voice of the hand saying, uh, whatever you do, just do it in a new way from this point forward. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's a new job, if it's a new way of looking for a job, thinking about a job, if it's a new type of work that you wouldn't describe as a job, that's fine. But, um, you know, this, this, this kind of inner voice kept uh, kind of leading me through this process early on in the year. So I would take these walks every day, you know, these, these daily walks. They became a really important part of my day. So I would get up and, and uh, put on my shoes and, and take off in the neighborhood here, you know, and, um, and take my walks. I put my headphones on, the ones I have here, and, and uh, sometimes some music or whatever, or something or a program on YouTube, whatever, playing in the, the headphones. And I'd, I'd walk around. I just kind of, that was like my meditation, I guess you'd call it, you know. So during these walks, you know, I kind of formulated some questions about what I was going to do with the rest of my life, because here I was in this sort of crossroads, I guess you'd call it, um, no job, I could do whatever I want next because the job was gone. COVID was making the, the way I had gone about looking for a job in the past obsolete. Um, it, it, you know, I kind of felt like maybe some of the things that I had been doing might become pretty soon obsolete also, just because of the advance of technology. So you know, during these walks, I was kind of asking, it was almost like, a, I don't want to call it a prayer, but it was a, a tuning in, you know, I would tune into where I was, where the world was. And I was asking, you know, what do, what do I do next? You know, what, what's next? What can I do? What's, what's a valuable use of my time uh, going forward? So very instantly, <laughs> Every uh, pretty much, I think I'd have to say every time that I would I would ask this question strongly, you know, in my own mind, uh, I would get this answer back in a slightly different way each time, and it was always the same answer. It was just phrased a little differently so that I would hear it this time. But it was saying to me, "What do you want to do?" Right, and you know, put, putting the ball back in my court, as as the expression goes. And uh, I, I said, well, I, you know, I know I've been doing marketing a long time and, and web development and, and this kind of heady, you know, SEO and data analysis and very heady, kind of heady stuff. I said, but I love to work with my hands. I always have loved working with my hands. If I'm totally honest, if I could do one thing for the rest of my life, you know, it would be to do something where I at least got to get my hands dirty every day. Uh, or um, be expressive and creative and and, uh, and and go down that road. So that was a prerequisite. You know, I had to be creative. I had to work my hands. I said, but I don't mind working with heavy technical information. I said, it's great. I said, I like the challenge. I don't mind that. Um, so I guess you can hear I'm, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm having kind of a conversation with an invisible force of some sort, right? So that's that's what it was in my mind. I'm just, I'm just, talking in my mind is through this whole thing. And uh, as I walk, you know, in my morning walks. And um, so uh, I, I decided uh, that I was just going to allow myself to try whatever came into my mind that was new and healthy and, and that uh, made me ring, if, if, uh, if I can put it that way. Again, some of the things I'm going to say here on this channel probably would sound a lot more, make a lot more sense on my other channel because the language is a little different, but let me see if I can still bring you along for the ride here. So um, I was only going to do things going forward that felt right, for lack of a better way to say it, that, that uh, did not things, if I, if, I, if I was about to do something and it made me feel nervous or in the wrong way, or it made me uh, apprehensive, or it made me think of something from the past that was no good, or something about the future that was no good, that wasn't going to work. You know, it had to be things that uh, make you feel good. Like when uh, I would work with sculpture in college and work with clay, that always made me feel good. So for me, that's a, that's a happy thing, right? So if I think about working with clay, I always feel good, right? So this became my thing on a day-to-day -day basis. I was going to do the things that in my mind 
and then my body felt good, you know, made me feel good in my mind. So that, um, <laughs> that triggered an avalanche is, is, I guess, the best way to say it. Now, at this point in this thought process, we're around April, right around the beginning of April. And, um, you know, I'd spent a few weeks taking my walks and tuning in. And one day I couldn't really put my finger on exactly what day of the month it was, you know, on a calendar. Um, but there was a definite day or a two or three day period where something sounds a little spooky, I guess, but something shifted, I guess is the right word to use. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound mysterious. Like it was a vision. It was a vision, but it was. Um, I'm used to this sort of thing because I've been very creative my whole life, and I'm just used to ideas coming very visually. It's part of my language, part of my visual language. But this was, this was one of these ones where it's it's beyond just the visual language, beyond just the normal kind of dipping your toes in the water. Ooh, I got a new idea. Let's play with that. This was like. What I, what I call a download, right? Um, and it included a lot of information I already had about things I had already done in the past 20 years ago, 25 years ago. It included bits and pieces of dreams and visions I've had for, uh, for you know, projects through the years that uh, never uh, got to be taken 100%. Um, in any case, all of these ideas and dreams and visions and back burner concepts that I'd had going on uh, for 25 years, all bubbled to the surface in this, this period earlier in the year. They came up for me and they started getting reintroduced into this new definition or this new patterning or this new uh, way I was thinking of myself, right? So the, the, all of the things that felt good to me from uh, my past started coming back uh, and, and saying hello, you know, and I would work them back in. So I started working with my hands every day and I started getting very strong impulses to begin combining certain ideas that had never, to me, had never been combined before. Um, and one of them was 3D printing. So right around May, I... I put together uh, the, the, the printer you see behind me. Actually, it's a <laughs> funny story. I put this together in May and turned it on, got it loaded, tuned it up, and it literally has not stopped running since May. Uh, I think maybe it spent a few hours total time shut down because I was making a repair maybe four or five hours total time, making a repair or um, uh, you know, doing something to the printer itself where I couldn't have it actively printing. But other than that, this printer has been running seriously 24 seven for the most part since May. So, hey buddy, <laughs> this is Stevie. Stevie's my partner. He, uh, he likes to uh, assist in all kinds of different things here at the shop, here in the, the mad studio. But uh, right now he's providing moral support and that's always welcome. So, hey buddy, um, been running nonstop since then. Uh, this printer has become such a fundamental, hey buddy, I'm gonna need to put you down for a sec, dude. You can fur all over my black, black backdrop. That's a hard one to say, back black drop. Say that 10 times fast. Back black drop, back black drop. Anyway, um, <laughs> Stay down there, please. Uh, he, um, he, she, it, they. The printer uh, has been running since then has become an absolutely integral part of everything that I do. Now, in the beginning, when I started using the printer, I was not designing anything myself on the computer. Um, I was taking uh, designs from Thingiverse uh, and a few other websites that uh, exist where you can download files and print them. And that's all I was doing. I wasn't very sophisticated with it. Okay, let's get you down here. But um, as I went on, you know, I had the, the need to start playing around with ideas uh, that I couldn't just go and download. Um, and that triggered a whole new kind of 
uh, influx of information that came to me. So what happened was, okay, um, 25 years ago, when I was living in Florida, I became interested in a couple of different things. Uh, one was alternative energy, specifically for the purpose of living, uh, well, not off-grid, but for supplementing uh, electric usage. Um, just because I use a lot of electricity, I always have. I'm an energy hog when it comes to electricity. All my tools are electric. Everything I'm interested in seems to run on batteries or electric or cable. Somehow it's connected to the juice, right? So... <laughs> I was really interested in lightening the load and learning how to produce energy off the grid so I didn't have to feel so darn guilty about all the energy I was using. So I got into that, but there really wasn't much I could do with it. Uh, and I didn't have a lot of money. I, uh, I didn't have a lot of space. Um, I didn't really have a project in mind. I was just interested in it. So I learned a lot about it. I just kind of hit the books. And uh, this was before the internet. So, you know, literally I was hitting books. I was getting books. I had a, a pretty extensive library at the time. So there was that whole off-grid solar, uh, wind energy, um, hydroelectric energy, uh, producing straw bale, uh, building technology, which is another thing I was really interested in. Straw bale uh, technology, geodesic domes, obviously, um, earthship technology uh, or methodology. Um, using natural materials, reusing materials, using, using garbage, uh, tires and bottles and cans and things like that, uh, old clothing as insulation, newspaper as insulation, things like that to uh, create more natural environments. That was also very, very interesting to me. I had some allergies uh, that were environmentally based, food based, um, that have throughout my life caused me a lot of hell. So, so finding pure ways of creating an environment um, in the house, in my body, uh, that uh, didn't have uh, so many toxins was very important. So I played around with, hi, buddy, I'm sorry, I got to keep kicking you off. Um, I had to, uh, I had to play around with, uh, with a lot of different materials, you know, um, for example, cats is one of my allergies. I'm okay with that now, more or less, but uh, cats, cats was one of them. Uh, so I was playing around with that. I'm very interested also uh, in the geodesic dome structure. Always have been since I was a little kid. As far back as I can remember, I loved the, uh, the geodesic domes. My mother, uh, my mother was a minister and she went to a church in... Oh, where was it? Media, Pennsylvania. And then later there was another Unitarian church in um, Cherry Hill, Pennsylvania. And both of them had geodesic domes or some sort of a dome structure uh, on, on location. And I love those things. I used to ride my skateboard around the inside of the one dome. And I fell in love with domes way back when. And uh, then once I was grown 25 years ago, uh, my mother and I took a trip uh, cross country together and we started talking about all these ideas. And that's really where I started bringing them together. Well, yeah, we talked about the domes and the living off grid and, and finding a piece of land and building a community and, and um, building a variety of different houses and different styles just to show what could be done. And, uh, you know, finding intentional communities that were a little more creative minded. And we talked about uh, Buckminster Fuller. My mother had actually, when she was in college, had um, uh, taken a course where Buckminster Fuller was one of the speakers. And he's, of course, the man who was credited with, they say, inventing the geodesic dome. He didn't actually invent the geodesic dome. Uh, the geodesic dome is a geometric structure. Uh, you see it on the wall behind me maybe, sort of, uh, that uh, obeys some very natural laws. And you can find the uh, geodesic dome in nature in the form of a carbon structure. Uh, so they found that after he patented the idea for the geodesic dome in 1953, scientists later discovered it in nature that it was already there. You know, so it's like, sorry, Bucky, you, you, didn't, you didn't invent that. You, you, you tapped into it you, and you got a patent for it, but you didn't invent that. <laughs> nature invented that. So uh, we talked a lot about that. 
So anyway, fast forward, uh, a lot of life happened in between then and now, but we fast forward all the way to uh, uh, this year, last year, 2020, uh, the whole COVID situation, the beginning of that, the loss of the job. I had also lost both of my parents uh, within pretty short amount of time of each other. And they, they hadn't been together since I was a child. Uh, they were divorced when I was four. Uh, so, you know, I had never known them really together, but they interestingly passed on almost together, you know, uh, one and then, uh, first my, my, uh, uh, my mother died. And then, uh, very shortly after about a year after my father died. So that was, uh, that was kind of strange how close together they were, but nevertheless, uh, that all happened just a few years ago. So that was in 2018. My mom went then in 2019, lost my dad. And then 2020, uh, lost the job. I'm not trying to make this sound like a sob story. Because it's absolutely not. It all worked out absolutely for the best. But um, nevertheless, what I mean is there was a lot of kind of mourning and, and letting go of the old and bringing in of the new. So at the beginning of this year, I was really ready for, I think, um, something new. You know, something that was a little more in tune with who I am and what I'd always been interested in and would always made me feel good. Um, and something that I knew was just for me, uh, it didn't really have too much to do with either of my parents. It wasn't marketing like was the world of my dad. Uh, and it wasn't just the spiritual side, which was more or less the, the, the side of my mother. It was kind of a, a blending of the two in a way. Uh, the uh, the physical and the the spiritual. So that was interesting to me. That's really that's really become my 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 mission for myself, or I guess it always was, uh, is uh, is really to kind of merge those two worlds because I've always been very technical, always worked with my hands, been very into technology, electronics, inventing, mechanics, physics. Uh, very into it and experimented extensively with, uh, with cymatics, uh, and many things. We'll go into all that later. I don't want to get into all that right now, but uh, suffice to say that uh, I wanted to merge those two. So here we are in April. I'm taking my walk still. And over the period of now, now we're entering into the summer of last year, started getting... Again, I'm going to use the word downloads because I don't know what else to call them. But uh, during not just my walks at this point, they would happen during my walks. But then uh, just during my routine, as, I, as I'd start tinkering around with putting together these ideas, I'd start getting this, this insane level of information uh, about how to get things done. I'd have an idea about something and I wouldn't quite know how to do it. Then all of a sudden I would know how to do it. And you just go and get the bits and pieces and put it together. I know how crazy that sounds. I know how crazy that sounds. Uh, sounds crazy to me too. But like I said, I'm kind of used to that because it, that for me, that's always been kind of the light version of how my creative process works. That's how I get information. I feel in these little mini downloads. But this was not a mini download. This was a big download. This was like a major OS update. So, okay, so here's what came to me. Whew, I'm announcing this to the world for the first time. Now, let me just put one more little caveat in there before I make this big announcement. Uh, the, the official announcement for this is a few weeks away. I'm actually uh, working with a very talented video producer that I know from uh, my previous work. And, and he and I are going to be putting together a video that is going to explain, hopefully, the, um, the way that this machine that I'm about to describe to you actually works, why, it's cre why I created it, what it's meant to do, how it works why a person may want one uh, or be interested in a lot of the technology that went into it. Um, that's what I'm hoping this video will explain. So here it is. Here we go. Almost one year ago, this whole thing started. And now what I have built 
right behind the uh, the computer here. I, I can't show it to you quite yet. I'm very, very sorry about that. I'm not trying to be a tease about it, but I, I do need to save the reveal until this video is done. But it is a machine, let's call it that, that anybody can build, anybody can build, using uh, off-the-shelf parts, meaning uh, none of the parts are anything special. You can get them in a box store, Home Depot, oh, I promised I wouldn't mention any names. Okay, you can get them in a box store. All the parts can be in a box store or it can be ordered online from your favorite online retailer. Um, the parts that are available from the, the box store are all inexpensive. So the raw materials for this are inexpensive, relatively inexpensive. I mean, it, it depends. If you consider filament for 3D printing to be expensive, um, I can't help you because I use a lot of filament. I do not consider it all that expensive. I think filament's a pretty good deal overall. Um, so a lot of filament. This machine implements a variety of technologies that were developed by NASA. And some of them have been perfected by uh, private industry. And it is a machine that fits in a the size of this table we're sitting at, about a six by six footprint on the ground. And it's about seven feet high. And it automatically will grow the contents of a normal outside garden. Uh, an enormous, an enormous amount of vegetables in a short amount of time, a small amount of space, using controlled measures of nutrients, clean water, distilled water, or purified water, uh, and cycling, light cycling, that is optimal for the plant's growth, so that you can grow, we, we don't know yet how many times more, but, but many more vegetables in a small amount of space indoors, or outdoors using this machine and everything that the plants need is contained on board in this lightweight machine. Oh, oh, by the way, and the machine weighs almost nothing because it, it's all made out of PVC piping uh, for the, used not really always as pipes to carry anything inside, just used as structural members because they're inert uh, it's safe to use them with water and food and so forth. Uh, and they're lightweight, easy to work with, um, easily available. And then those are combined with a variety. I can't wait to show you this part. A variety, wide variety of 3D printed parts that all fit together with the PVC piping to build this structure that has light panels, LED light panels. It has a rotating drum that contains all of the plants, the uh, lettuce, spinach, kale, whatever you're growing. On the outside of it, the big barrel contains all the plants growing. The roots are on the inside, the plants are on the outside. That's all part of this, but that weighs nothing. The barrel's made of plastic, it weighs hardly anything. Then there's an air pump, very small, small. Small meaning like about that big air pump, maybe that wide, that long. Yeah, about that, about that tall. Yeah, very small, very small. Uh, 12 volt air pump. And then a control panel, which uses a variety of uh, components that are all, again, available on uh, online retailers uh, for inexpensive, not nothing expensive all put together in such a way that it is, as, uh, as I used to say on the, on the commercials on TV, it's set it and forget it. That's the concept here is you, you get your seeds started, you put your seeds in the aeroponic unit, the aeroponic machine. The aeroponic machine is started. It continues to monitor the plant's growth, giving the plants 24 of them, in this case, 24 individual plants, giving them everything that they need, giving them the food that they need, the water that they need, 
and the carbon dioxide that they need, the heat to their root zone that they need, everything that they need automatically delivered exactly what they need all the time. So it's kind of like the the, the ultimate spa setting for your plants, you know, you're just pampering them. You're saying, all right, sit back, take the lounger. You know, they're sitting back, they're chilling out, they're growing, they're soaking up the sun. You're bringing them drinks. You know, they're sitting by the pool. Your plants are happy as can be. Their roots are dangling in the water in the pool and they're just hanging out. They're happy as can be. There are 24 of them and you're giving them the ultimate life. And then uh, you can harvest directly from that. Uh, depending on what you're harvesting, some of those leaves could be pinched off and, and the plant could continue to grow. Some of them not. Some of them you have to harvest all at one time. Depends what you're growing. Uh, but uh, yeah, this, this, this system is able to be completely disassembled, put into the the plastic barrel, the bits and pieces of the machine are put into the plastic barrel and the plastic barrel itself, which are used for shipping in, in, in industry, uh, it's what's used to ship food. Uh, you put all the parts in this barrel, seal it up, and that's what you send to the customer. And the customer has that literally the packaging material becomes part of the machine. How cool is that? <laughs> love this so yeah i can't wait i can't wait i just can't wait to talk about this i can't wait to show this i can't wait to actually like have this all set up with a really dramatic background a black background some lights on it and stuff you know and just and just really really show this off we're just going to go all out we're going to do this video it's going to look so cool because it has i mean i say it's taken it, it, it took the past year it's been the last year of my life that uh, this is all i've done this is it uh, my, my wife will tell you, Stacy will tell you, this is, uh, I'm adjust this light here. It's like right in my eye. Let me take that one. Yeah, it's that one. I'm going to push this back here. So, um, this has been it for the last year. This has been my entire life. Uh, I have done things I never thought I would do or, or knew how to do. I had to learn them on the fly. You know, that's how it works with this, with these things. Uh, 3D printing, though, has been an absolutely huge part of this. So we are uh, a, you know, a few weeks at least away from release of this actual uh, AeroGrow. It's called the AeroGrow, by the way, the AeroGrow Home Food Production System. Uh, and we're a couple weeks away. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, do what I originally planned to do today on the show, which is show you some of the stuff that you gotta go through to get to where we are today. Ah, oh, not the best camera angle for that dump. Well, all right, let's do this. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, before you get working products, things that actually can get sold to people in the outside world. You need to make a lot of stuff. So, wow, this isn't even, I have, uh, I'm gonna have to show you this. Okay, here we go. I'm showing this to you. I'm gonna aim the camera over here. Don't mind the living room. All right. I am going to show you, seriously now, you're not going to believe this. In addition to everything I just dumped out, okay, we have another bag of stuff here, prototypes, all of it from the past year. Here we go. Here it is. This is called research and development. This was a lot of research and development. Now, I could have, you know, probably thrown a little bag of stuff and said, yeah, yeah, I could tell you all about how to save filament because look, 
in this whole development process, I only had this tiny bag of unusable parts. But that would have been silly because the realism of this whole thing is that, oh wow, I made a lot of, a lot of prototypes. Um, I have not put this on a scale. I'm going to because now I'm really curious how much all this actually weighs. I'm going to go ahead and move all of this <laughs> down here just because it's going to be easier to clean up later. And then we'll talk a little bit about what I learned. Sorry for the noise. I'm just going to go ahead and continue to introduce some audio drama in this video by throwing my junk around the house. Oh, plus the cats are going to love this. All right. Almost, almost done. All right, here we are. Almost, almost. And there's a couple more pieces here. A couple more pieces. All right. All right, here we go. Okay, back to it. So, turn that. Camera down. <laughs> Let me just get one last shot of this too. I don't like share the glory here. All right. That's, yep. That's the file. That's it. That's one year. One year. It goes around the corner. Don't forget. It goes around the corner. That's one year. We don't know how many kilos worth of uh, plastic. P-E-T-G. So, yeah, that's the stuff I was not able to use. So if you were to add that to the parts that I did use, I have no clue how many kilos that is, but uh, I could, uh, you know, I could do the I could do the math on that and let you know. So tell me if you're uh, you're interested, and I'll do the math on that. Otherwise, I am absolutely not going to do the math on that. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, what have I learned? Okay, so I definitely do know some things about how to save filament when you're printing. I mean, I wasn't kidding about that. I had to learn that. I mean, obviously, you can't go through can't go through your 3D printing life doing this all the time forever. Um, so um, let me pick a piece and talk about it here. Uh, what do we have here? I can show you. Okay, cool. Here's one piece. Good example. Wait, I need another one. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the infill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, just, let me just talk about that for a minute. Okay, so on a previous episode, we talked about uh, tapping threads into, uh, into, into parts and how the smart thing to do once you know what size screw you want to use in your final part. The smart thing to do is to pre-drill pre a hole, I'm sorry, pre-print a hole in your piece so that when you go to drill it later, it's not such a big deal. You already have most of the materials gone that your drill's likely to hit, your drill's only going to hit what it needs to hit, and then you're going to do your, tap your threads, and then you're going to put your screw in, and everybody's going to be happy. Now, here's what we have to talk about. This piece I wanted to show you because, uh, let me get a better light on there. Okay, so let me get something to point with here. Uh, uh, yeah, I could probably point with, no, that doesn't work. Let me try this. Okay, that worked. So when I pre-drilled this or pre, I did it again, pre-printed this part, there's a circle in the middle, right? And that's the open, it's my open circle I printed to it, right? So the outside wall of the circle, so this, this, this wall inside here in the circle is what the outline feature in your software is talking about. Now, what that means is that if you look really carefully, let me see if I can get this a little better on camera. Gonna yeah, take a second here. Okay. okay. If you look carefully here, right here, around the outside of this circle, there's only probably two layers of filament 
<laughs> it's hard for me to do this in reverse. I'm really sorry. But around around the outside of the circle, there's probably only a wall thickness of one or two, probably two um, uh, filament, lines of filament, right? Let me take a look. Yeah, there are two. Yeah, there are two. Because when I printed this part, I was printing it very, very fast. I needed it was a spindle, a spindle spacer. I needed to print it fast just to see if this hole would fit over the metal spindle that I was placing it over, right? I just wanted to make sure. So I only printed like, like I don't know, 10, 20, 30 layers, right? That's about 30 layers. And then I stopped, took it out of the printer, went over to my piece that I needed to test fit it onto, tried it, found that it was great. So then I go back in uh, to the software and I'm like, okay, uh, I don't, now, now, now that I know that it fits, right? We tested it, and I did it with with one or two uh, outlines on on everything. My setting set to one or two, just real flimsy. One or two, flimsy. You don't want to use that in your final part, right? But I did it just to get it done fast. So now I go back in. I say, okay, increase my outlines to four, right? It gives me twice as much material. Okay, that's the important thing twice as much material around the outside of this ring, which means twice as much material for your drill to drill into and remove something from, twice as much material for your tap to bite threads into this material, twice as much now. So I would say this, if you're printing parts about this size or a little bit bigger or like the parts you see on the floor here and you're using M3, M4, M5, and M6 uh, nuts to fasten everything together. I would say for M3, and we talked about M3 is about as low as you want to go. Don't go lower than that. M3, because your threads aren't big enough. This is plastic. I mean, yeah, don't be goofy. So M3, M4, are going to be probably a wall thickness of three. That's what I would do. M4, M5, M6, you're going to want an outline of like four or five. And you may even go, depending on the part, depending on how heavy the part is, depending on, on at, especially towards M6, you may even want to go like a six, maybe use an outline of six just to kind of match six millimeter match that out to that big bolt that you're about to use. That's probably not a bad idea. Now, what you have to keep in mind, okay, this is really super important. If you, now, the, okay, on this part, using this as an example again, this outline around the center circle is, is probably two, right? An outline of two. And this is probably an outline of two, right? So if I now bump it up to four, and I let this thing run its entire run. It's in its final uh, iteration. It's about, uh, I believe it's, uh, I don't know. It's maybe 30, it's maybe 30 centimeters tall, right? So in its final iteration, about 30 centimeters tall. And all, now all of the walls are four, are four thick, which means that you have a lot of extra plastic. Now that does not include the honeycombing on the inside. That's infill, that's different. But if your outline is set for four, you're putting a lot of plastic on the outside of that, uh, the outside of that part. Your part's gonna get heavy. It's gonna get strong. It's definitely gonna get strong, but it may be so that your outside strength is quite simply so darn strong that the inside honeycombing is not in balance with that as a design. You know what, that gets a little technical. I'll get into that later, but let's just say, uh, yeah, pay attention to that, to that outline because that outline is where the strength of your holes are gonna come from, especially if you need to build up some material so that you can drill into it. So keep those settings a little bit higher than you might normally for other types of parts. It's gonna be functional, keep the outline high. Okay, so that I learned. Uh, pretty recently, because I was uh, starting to get into drill tapping, uh, thread tapping, just a few months ago. Now, let me see what else I can grab from this pile of goodies here we can talk about a bit.
Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> I scared the kitty. Um, yeah, okay, that's a good one. I'll take that. Yeah, here we go. There's some good ones. Ah, it's another good one. Okay, yeah, all kinds of stuff to talk about. Now, that's called spaghetti, and I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with that. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so, yeah, I have enough spaghetti to start an Italian restaurant down in the basement. I didn't even throw that in the bag because it just takes up too much space. Okay. So, let me adjust these lights again because they're making me nutty. Okay, let me move that. Where is that light coming from? Where is that? What is that? Is that the window? Oh, that's the window. Okay, can't do anything about that. Sorry, I got these glasses on. That's bouncing off the window there. Sorry about that. Okay, so here we have two different parts with two different infills, right? This this one over here is probably about 25% infill. This one's probably 15, maybe 20. So as you can see, the infill is a little bit tighter, a little bit more dense on this one, a little bit looser on this one. But here's the thing. Both of these parts have to hold a motor, okay? You can see, actually, the shapes are fairly similar. The, the motor goes in here. The motor can I'll do this a different way. The motor goes in here, or the motor goes in here. Do I have a motor here? Hold on. No, I don't, but pretend, uh, pretend this is a motor, right? So the motor fits in here, or the motor fits in here, right? Now, the difference between these, and the reason that the honeycombing is different on the infill here, is because most of the stress of this part, okay, is in this direction, which means this way, this way, it's strong. It's really strong, even with just that infill we see there. It's really, really strong this way. It's really strong, it's super strong this way. Let me show it to you. So if you're going mm, like that, if you're going, Trying to twist like that against that type of infill, honeycomb like that, a lot of strength, right? Because you have strength this way, right? Mm, can't do it. But with this one, okay, we had a whole different situation here because with this part, this motor always wants to be pulling down. Wants to be, because this is on a, it's hard to describe, but this is, sits on a tube when it's all done, right? And then this part wants to push down. So I laid out the honeycomb on the inside so that it's pushing against, as it pushes down, it's pushing against these honeycombs on the interior part here in the corner. And that creates a great amount of strength. So without getting too deeply in, my point is this, you often don't need as much infill as you think you do to create strength because ultimately, Infill is not the only thing creating strength, not by far. The, I mean, you could put it this way. You could create a part with one layer of outline and 50% of infill, and the part may still fail because now what would happen is you'd have one layer of outline on the outside here. You'd have a lot of honeycombing on the inside. It would be pretty solid in there. But if anything happened to sacrifice the outside layer of your part, the honeycomb is exposed. It's easy to peel or break or shatter or crack or whatever on the outside. And then all of a sudden your interior doesn't matter anymore. It's exposed. So it would be better in that circumstance to have a little more of an outline in order to protect your honeycomb into your structure. Now, your honeycombing into your structure also supports your exterior outline, right? So they work together and getting to the point where you know kind of how much infill to combine with how much outline based on what type of part it is, where the stresses are gonna be ultimately on the part and so forth. It takes a bit of practice is really how you get there. 
Uh, there are many things we can talk about in these videos. If you want to talk about those principles and break them down and unpack them, I'd be happy to do that. Let me know. Please do. Like, subscribe. As always, like, subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments what you'd like to, uh, to hear more about. So that was the other thing. Combination of uh, infill and outlining is the way to get to strength. Now, another way to get to strength in parts is... Uh, oh boy, this will be easy to show if I do it the right way. Okay, now this part, this is a plug. Okay, now this is actually, <laughs> the funny part about this is, it's, let me do get a, I'm just gonna run and get a flashlight from the kitchen really quickly. I can show this much better with a flashlight. Hold on one second. Okay, let's try that. So, this is actually a plug used in the Aero Pro system to, um, to plug the end of one of the PVC pipes so that the PVC piping can be turned into a, an air storage device, uh, which I'll be showing you in a couple of weeks. Can't show you right now, sorry. But the point of this piece was to be an airtight plug because they didn't sell such a thing. You can't just go into Home Depot or those and buy an airtight plug that fits on the inside of a piece of pipe. Wait, let me see if I can find a piece of pipe. Uh, yeah, 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 right here. So PVC, right? This plug printed goes on the inside here and it gets, whoops, whoops. It gets, whoops, like that. You see that? Okay, so it goes on the inside of this here and then it gets siliconed. I uh, use silicone bead around the whole thing. First, I put the silicone in here. Then I put the plug in, push it down, squeeze it a little bit. Then I run another bead of silicone on it, and then I let it dry, right? Well, here's the thing. When I printed this, check this out. It's like completely transparent. Like you can see right the hell through it, right? Because it's it's, you know, it's not printed correctly. It had I had a an under what's called an under extrusion problem. See if I can I can show you that a little better. Yeah. Check that out. You can see right through it. Now if I wanted this thing to if I wanted this thing to act like a act like a, a filter, perfect. Jeez. Maybe I could custom design filters on this thing that would work better than the ones I can buy in the store. There's an idea. But no, I was not looking for a filter. I was looking for the opposite of a filter, which was a plug. <laughs> I was trying to keep the air from moving through the, the tube. So here's, here's, here's what happened. This was just a classic case of under extrusion. Now, when you print big like this, when you print with a point, uh, I'm printing at the moment with a 0.6 nozzle. This is PET G. Uh, I'm running this at 255 degrees on the nozzle, 81 degrees on the bed. It's set for 80. It's running at 81. I'm not sure why. Um, this under extrusion was probably being caused by either a dirty Bowden tube. Okay, because a dirty Bowden tube, again, remember, the whole point is for that filament to move through that tube as easily and as stress-free as possible so that it gets from the spool all the way up and over the mountain to grandmother's house, all the way down to the hot nozzle, right? It's got to go a long way. It's carrying a backpack, you know, it's got, you know, a cake for grandma, this filament. It's got a lot to do and a long way to go. So it's got to get from here all the way up and over to there. And you got to make the job easy. And if that, uh, if that tubing gets dusty, which it does get dusty on the inside from the little bit of dust that gets released from uh, the filament, just part of the manufacturing process, it produces dust. It deposits itself inside the tube, and then over time, it restricts the tube's inner diameter, kind of like plaque on the inside of an artery, sort of, kind of. And then the filament can't get through, just like blood can't get through your artery if it's clogged up, right? So you need to be making sure that that is nice and clean and ready to go. Uh, just buy a new one. Don't be cheap. Don't try to fix it. Just, just you may be able to, you know, blow it out and get another couple of days or something or whatever you want to do. Do something strange. But 
go on your favorite online retailer and just order a couple of them, have them on hand. Um, not going to mention any brands, but there is one that uh, you see show up quite a, quite often um, that uh, is touted to be kind of the best. Um, I would go with that one. Uh, I've used a couple of those and they seem to work really well. So that's one thing that can cause you under extrusion. Now, the other thing that can cause under extrusion, and I found in my case, this was what was happening. The temperature, when, okay, when you are trying to squeeze this filament through a larger nozzle, a nozzle that really was designed to deliver filament at a speed appropriate for its temperature, but only at 0.4 millimeters, right? That's what the machine was designed for, right? But now you want to push all of that same material at the same temperature through a larger nozzle, which means the nozzle has to heat the filament faster because it has to get it hot so that a moment later, when it delivers it down to the nozzle, it's at exactly the right temperature to send it where it needs to go. Now, what happens is that, I'm just gonna plug in the computer, it's about to, oh, power cable came out. Thank you, kitties. Um, the, what happens is the filament now, when you go to deliver it through that nozzle, it cannot heat it up quite fast enough. And so it's too thick to push it through the nozzle by the time it gets to the nozzle. So what I do, and I know that there are probably going to be some who say that this is not a great technique, but this is the technique I've had to do in order to get the job done. But what I do is, here, let me adjust that. That was right in my eyes here is I turn up the temperature. I used to run this, I used to run this filament at 242 degrees. I now run it at 255 degrees, okay? 13 degrees Celsius warmer, which in uh, Fahrenheit is like almost 30 degrees warmer. I run it hotter and I slow down the printing speed, but I don't, I don't, I don't, slow down the printing speed from the software. I slow down the printing speed from here manually so that if I go back in the software and I go to print a part at 0.4, it'll still print relatively okay. I haven't changed the settings on the software side. So when it gets here, it's not expecting a, it's not automatically expecting a 0.6 nozzle. It's expecting a 0.4 nozzle. So if I make the adjustment here, I can override the settings from the software, which are set up for 0.4. So I make them here. I set it for 255. I override the temperature. And then uh, I slow it down from 100% speed down to sometimes 50, 40, 30, depending on how tall the part is. It's another thing we can talk about. Um, and that does a really good job. In fact, I would say that this terrible, oops, let me use the, uh, use the flash right here instead. This really, really uh, terrible extrusion here was fixed in one more printing. I remember this really specifically. Was printed in one more go by increasing to 255 and by slowing it down to way down. I was down to like 30% and then it just whoosh, squeezed it right out. No problem. The other thing that you can run into and the thing that can cause, uh, um, you know, some extrusion problems is if, oh, these lights, I got to really do something about these, um, is if, uh, if your nozzle is clogged. And I know that sounds weird, uh, but it's a real thing. So what I do is uh, I keep, and they actually they, they, they ship the uh, nozzles, replacement nozzles ship with uh, what are acupuncture needles. I don't know if you know that, but uh, the stainless steel, stain, bleh, stainless steel needles that they ship with, um, and they're big ones, they're big acupuncture needles, are made to just, I don't have any right here, 
are made to actually jam up into the nozzle when the when the filament is hot and then just kind of you know plunge it like a toilet uh, and pull out some of those uh, those bit those uh, clumpy kind of uh, boogery pieces that might be stuck in there. It works okay. Uh, I actually don't think the problem that I've had has ever been a clogged nozzle. I think it's been a combination of uh, changing materials, uh, meaning I needed to increase the temperature of the nozzle. I think I've had some cross drafts because I had the printer in uh, the basement. Um, I think that was causing a problem. I think uh, maybe it was messing with my settings a little bit by cooling down everything from the outside because I had a cross breeze going through. So that's a good tip. You know, that's a tech tip for today too is try to, if you can, I know what kind of house you live in. I mean, everybody lives in different houses with different airflow and different things. But try to locate the printer in a place where uh, you're going to have minimal airflow, minimal air disturbance, meaning not a lot of opening and closing of doors, not a lot of windows opening and closing, not a lot of people walking by. Um, no, obviously no fans, you know, you don't want any blowers on it. You don't want any radiators nearby, anything like that. Um, you just, you want a place where the, the, the atmosphere in the house is stable most of the time, right? So for me, what that turned out to be was I had this one space uh, down in the basement, kind of under the stairs, more or less, uh, tucked away in a corner, uh, blocked by a wall on one side, blocked by a slightly smaller wall on the other side, and then it had a wall on the third side. So the only place you could get to it was by walking at it, right? So it was pretty well protected. Not a lot of airflow. Um, it's in a basement, so... You know, not a lot of airflow. Um, works really well down there. Uh, the place where I had most of the problems was in the garage when I was temporarily set up out there from April when I first set it up uh, till about May, June, July, August, maybe August or so, I think. Uh, wound up bringing it back inside. But I had it set up in the garage and it was probably the dumbest place I could have possibly set up the printer. Uh <laughs> I learned later that uh, just about everything you do not want to do when you're trying to create a stable atmosphere for a 3D printer, yeah, I totally just blew every one of those out of the water when I put it out in the garage. Uh, I had, I mean, cross drafts. Every time I opened the garage door, it was like a wind tunnel coming through there, right? Um, windows, two windows, and two windows, one huge door, and one small door all in the garage. Dust. Dust, ah, mega dust all the time. Terrible. Um, heat extremes because the garage in the summer would get, you know, 90 degrees, 100 degrees, 110 degrees on a really hot day. That was affecting the temperature. And then it would drop at night, right? And then uh, I'd still be running, maybe the same print job. So it would go from 100 degrees in the day to 70 degrees at night. It would have a 30 temperature, 30 degree temperature drop. And I expected it to run perfectly, and that was absolutely insane. So <laughs> try, to find, try to find a stable environment to put it in. Your printer will thank you, and uh, you'll save a lot of money on, on filament. Uh, let's see. What else can I tell you here? Uh, what have I learned? Boy, wow, boy, I've learned a lot. Um, hmm. Oh, oh, okay. All right, yeah. PLA versus PETG. Okay, that'll be the last thing we cover for today. I think that'll be a good start to everything here. So, uh, PLA, test, test run on PLA, and PETG, same, same part, PLA, PETG, just test run side by side. Why do I choose PETG? Well, when I got into 3D printing, I got into 3D printing for a very specific reason, because when I learned what could be done with 3D printing in its current state of evolution, uh, it ticked off a lot of boxes for me, things that I had been wanting to do for many, many years, but was unable to do. Um, and that is really what brings us here today, is that 3D printing uh, I will just give credit to it. 3D printing is the reason I have been able to launch these ideas into reality. Um, without 
these pieces, I wouldn't really even know how to begin because the way that I work is I'm very hands-on as a creative person. I like to build things. I like to make models. I like to do prototypes. I like to make it work now, right? And I think that a lot of people that are going to be attracted to this channel are probably going to be similar-minded in that way. We want to get the tool we need, learn how to do it, go do it, right? So that's what I did. But um, there was a hell of a learning curve. So there was a lot... Uh, a lot going on here that I had never dealt with before. But I would not have been able to do this project, this AeroGro project, or even the, uh, the the domes, which use completely 3D printed hubs. We'll get into that one later, too. Um, wouldn't have been able to do it without 3D printing. So along the way in the last year, I learned an awful lot. I really do hope I can pass it on to everybody in the audience. Uh, I know I only have a few subscribers. I'm hoping that will grow. Uh, if you would like to uh, keep seeing some more of these videos, and if this is at all helpful, please do do me a favor, like and subscribe to it. Uh, it helps get me out there on the algorithm, and that's what we need to do right now so I can continue to bring this to you. Um, I'm going to be covering other things. I'll be working on, uh, like we talked about, uh, alternative energy projects. Um, and I have another thing that I'll be telling you about it's hanging on the wall back here. I'm not going to talk about it now, but that's a whole other thing that's 25 years old that uh, has been uh, brewing on the back burner that we're going to touch on going forward. But the arrow grows the next thing in the lineup you're going to be learning about. And all of the, this is the point, all of the processes that went into designing, developing, building, prototyping, and launching the arrow grow system were done in this house in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And if I can do this and you know, launch a brand new product to the world in a, in, a, in, a, in a twin, in a brick twin, a 1926 brick twin in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in the midst of COVID, I'm pretty sure whatever it is you're working on and whatever kind of brilliance it is you have to bring to the world, you're gonna be able to do it just fine. All right. And I'm going to help to get you there. Whatever you need to know how to do, maybe you need to fill in some gaps. Maybe I know something about it. Let me know how I can help. So that's what we're going to do. All right. There's a lot more to talk about in that pile down there, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to end it here because I don't want to be overwhelming. I do have a tendency to go on. As uh, anybody who knows me will tell you, I have a tendency to go on and on. So um, there we are. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining the channel. I love this whole live thing. I'm about 10 minutes over time today. I'm normally only going to be an hour. But uh, thank you for tuning in. If you did, I still don't know if there were any viewers. But if there were not, I'm sure somebody will be watching this in the future. Thanks again. Like and subscribe. Catch you next time.